welcome to the First Congregational Church of North Brookfield. Let's please stand together as we start our morning with worship.
heaven's perfect light to the darkest night. Holy fire burning out of control. Holy fire burning out of control. Grace and mercy came, he wrote me a new name. Holy fire burning out of control. Love has captured me and now I'm running free Only fire burning out of control Only fire burning out of control Jesus with the fire It's burning in my heart Holy Ghost revival And it's lighting up the dark Kingdom never is found, we're walking holy ground, holy fire burning out of control, what the darkness stole, my Jesus has made hope, holy fire burning out of control.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Please be seated. Well, welcome and good morning, church family. It's good to be here with you again. Um, Pastor Joe and Annie are in New York um, at Nate Rybicki's, uh, for Rick, Nate Rybicki's wedding yesterday, I believe it was, to, I think it's yesterday. So Nate is married, a married man now, and we wish him only happiness and joy in his married life. Um, next Saturday, we have a couple announcements next Saturday, um, 8.30 men's breakfast. Come, bring friends, and really have some time of fellowship and learning together. And then the big thing for July that's happening is July 22nd through the 26th, our hometown Nazareth VBS program. The last staff meeting is this coming week, July 10th, 6.30, over in the church office building. So we're looking forward to this, and we all should start praying for our kids that are coming to this Vacation Bible School. After the service, again, we will, if you follow through that door, we will have brunch for everyone. Um, and so please stay and have brunch and meet some of the people in church that maybe you don't know yet. And we always have lots of visitors. So we, we invite you to stay and just, you know, fellowship with us. We also have, um, in your pews, you should have a card like this. On one side it says, let's connect. And if you are new here today or you're fairly new and you've never filled out one of these, we would love it if you'd fill out the information on the front of the card and put it in the offering plate. That way we can keep in touch with you. Um, every two weeks we send out a newsletter, um, and if there's, important, if there's important announcements about services, we would send those out also. On the back is a thing that said, let's pray. And if you had need prayer at all, then you could write a prayer request here. So these are for more non-immediate, but also important prayer requests. These prayer requests, again, you're going to put it in the offering tray. 
Um, they come to me and I put them out to the diaconate and then I also put them out to a group of people called prayer warriors. So we have lots of people who pray in this church and they are going to pray for whatever you put on these cards. This is our time of prayer at our church, and right now I would like to remind you that we pray for what we call our extended church family. These are people who are part of our church family, and for years they came and sat in the pews like you did, and for now, for some reason, they can't be here. And they, very many of them watch on Zoom, or later on they'll watch on YouTube, but we want to remember them and pray for them because these people are part of our church family. I also have a couple of other prayer requests that have already been made, and I'll share those with you, and then I'll ask if you have any additional prayer requests. So Dick Gelinas, in this past week, he had his third surgery after that very serious surgery he did have, um, and he is now back out of the hospital, and he's been taken over uh, to Overlook, where he's undergoing wound treatment and um, PT. So please keep him and Barbara in your prayer. He's going in the right direction. It's slow, and they knew it was going to be slow, but he's going in the right direction. Also, Dick Barney, who had um, heart surgery, open heart surgery very recently, has now developed, had now developed pneumonia, and he will also be going to Overlook, so we'll pray for him. And finally, Sharon Arnold had a great niece born yesterday, and her name is Yvonne, and she looks like a very healthy, happy little girl, so we'll pray for that little girl and her family. Does any one of the rest of you or many of the rest of you have any prayer requests that need to be made right now? Karen? So that he was on a bike, he said. Oh my goodness. Okay, Dr. Lohman. Lel? Okay, anybody else? Okay, so her name is Lori. And she did okay through the treatments? She just had the first treatment, so just, you know. You gotta keep going. Good. Thank you. Go ahead, Judy. Okay, Bill? Did you have one? Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to ask everybody's help here. Uh, Colleen's sister-in-law died last week. She'd been fighting her drug addiction for 40-something years. She finally died last year, last week, Tuesday. She was 68. And uh, the family's having some issues dealing with this. Thank you. OK. And she was a sister of Colleen's or a sister-in-law? Uh, sister-in-law. OK. Anyone else? I'm looking. Right here. Where am I missing? Okay. Marcia? Okay. Bruce's friend. Wish I could write faster. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, let's let's go to prayer and pray together for these things. Lord Jesus, we come before you today thankfully and humbly, and we ask for all these things that have been stated, but we also ask for the things that are in people's heart that they haven't talked about out loud. We pray for our extended church family. We ask you to watch over them and care for them, especially in this heat and humidity. And we ask you to be with Dick and Barbara Gelinas. Please, Lord, continue to work with Dick to have his body healed and give them both some rest from all of this. 
We ask you, Lord, to heal him completely so that he can come home and then he can come back and join us in church. We pray for Dick Barney, Lord, who has pneumonia after heart surgery, and we ask you just to be with him and give him your comfort. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the birth of Yvonne yesterday, and we ask you to be in her life and make yourself known to her as she grows and to give her health and happiness in her life. Lord, we lift up Dr. Lohman before you right now, Lord. He's described as a, a kind and generous and good doctor and a man who wanted to retire and now has had this horrible accident. Lord, we ask you to stand beside him in the ICU and give him your peace and your comfort and to heal him. Lord, we also ask you to be with Lori who's going through chemotherapy and it is a difficult thing when you have to go through that particular kind of therapy to get rid of the cancer. So we ask you, Lord, to stand beside her too, as well as Sharon, who is standing beside her friend. Lord, she needs to know about you, and, and Sharon is really trying to model you and share you with her. So open her ears and open her heart to you so that she may come to believe and trust in you. Lord, be with Bob Downey as he fights another infection and just bring him back to health and so that he can be comfortable and be with us again in church. Lord, we pray for Colleen and we pray for the, the family who has lost a sister-in-law who has struggled so within her life. We ask you, Lord, to just pour your peace and your comfort on the family and give them peace as they grieve together and go on. We ask you, Lord, also to watch over Cindy Green, who continues to have health problems and who is suffering from the death of the grandson, Derek. Please be with that entire family and give them your comfort. Finally, Lord, we pray for Bruce as he faces the loss of his friend, Ralph, who is going on hospice. Help Bruce spend good time with his friend in the days that are left and have peace knowing that one day they will be together again in heaven. Finally, Lord Jesus, please pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we pray. Lord, please be with me today as I share what you put on my heart. Um, watch over all the things that go wrong with my crazy body. Uh, Lord, just watch over the technology, all the things that Satan thinks he can do to fool us, but he's not doing it anymore. And so I ask you, Lord, these things that I always ask you, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Turn it back on? Okay. Better? Okay. All right. So I titled this particular talk today, What is Genesis Really About? And I actually put a world there because I expected most of you to say, well, everybody knows Genesis is about creation, right? And if we're thinking about creation, and I think about it sometimes, I, again, I always put myself visibly in my mind in the situation. I'm like, how cool that would have been to be there and see all this in six days created. And, and I would be really interested in this idea of the creation of two people that were coming into the world fully grown. So a fully grown man and then a fully grown woman. And I remember once when I drew a picture in Sunday school and teacher said, no, nope, you did that wrong. And I said, why? She said, you gave them a belly button. They couldn't have a belly button. And I'm like, whoa, that's so cool. And so I remember stuff like that. So what is Genesis really all about? And how come God didn't just drop us all on earth fully grown? He could have done that. I mean, he did it for the first two, but he didn't do it after that. So that's been something that's been sticking in my head for a while. And as I prayed about it, God kind of made it known to me what was going on. And I found out that God is about relationships. He's not about us being alone. He's about having us in relationships. And there's a relationship, the most important one we have is the relationship between God and man, and the relationship between God and the church, and then there's a relationship between us, the people in the church, and then there's the relationship we're supposed to have with unbelievers, and then there is the big relationship we're going to talk about today, the relationship of the family. And that's where we're going today with this, but I'm going to make it a little bit more specific than that. 
I want you to recognize, though, that I think why God stopped dropping people individually had to do with the fact that sin came into the world. And sin messes up a lot of things, and sin definitely makes relationships very messy. So I'll ask the question again, what is Genesis really about? And the answer I'm going to give you is this. Genesis, from the very first chapters to the very end chapter, Genesis is about families and sibling rivalry. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and I need water. Leave it there. Okay, so what's sibling rivalry? What is this stuff, sibling rivalry? I actually found a definition that I thought was pretty much um, easy to understand. Sibling rivalry is the jealousy and the competition and the fighting between brothers and sisters. Is that a surprise to any of you? You better all say no, because either I had a really bad family or it's pretty normal and natural. And in fact, if you read some of the psychological te texts, they'll say sibling rivalry is normal and it should be expected. And I'm like, no, it really shouldn't be expected. It really is, in many cases, all about sin. And when we go into it a little bit more, we can say that there are three things that contribute to sibling rivalry, especially in Genesis. And they really are there. It's the children's personalities and insecurities. Every child is different within a family. It is also, and I hate to say this as a parent and grandparent, but it's parents' preferences for certain children. Hmm, it does happen. We do see it. I do admit there was times that I felt closer to one of my children or the other children just because of what was going on in their life and who I was. I fought against it, but it was there. And finally, there are cultural expectations for the child's birth order. Now, not so much these days, but certainly in my family, when my brother, the golden child, the baby was born, my mother had a little, like, cabinet that she called, put all his trophies in. And it was still, it was the one of the things she took with her into the place, you know, her last living place. So there was still, even in my family, the first boy is it. So the cultural expectations we're going to find within Genesis are this. In Eastern cultures, firstborn sons have special authority, they have more honor, but they have the responsibility of taking care of the land and the inheritance and everything else that's going on in terms of the family. Once the father dies, his older son takes over, he's in charge of doling out whatever he can or will to the rest of his brothers and sisters. And that's the way the culture works, and it worked that way in Genesis. But that was not God's intention. And so Pastor Joe talks about subverting, turning things upside down. And so what you will find as we go through this this morning is that God comes into the situations in these families and he turns it upside down. And suddenly it's the younger son who's more important, the younger son who's going to carry God's plan forward. And he does that simply to show that he is in charge of families and what's going on. So I'm going to talk about three families, kinds of families today, and I want you to be always, as I talk about the Genesis families, I want you to be thinking about how that might apply to the three families you might belong to. Now, the first one is the family you grew up in. This is my family. So this is me standing behind my father. And as you notice, I'm the only one who didn't get the blonde hair. And one of the earliest jealousies I remember is, why the heck did my stupid sister Janice get blonde hair and I got this dark hair? And I don't even know where that came from, but it was something that I felt. And it was something that I really stayed with me for a long time. There also is a 10-year difference between my sister Janice and then my sister Holly. So that's another whole family that was raised in another whole place because we moved from Illinois to Connecticut. And so they were like in a whole other world for me, and it's always been hard. I will say to you right now that I haven't seen my sister Holly, and, or heard, well, I haven't seen her since 2001, and I haven't heard from her since 2011. I do not even know where she is or what's going on. So all families have stuff like this, and it's stuff that hurts, and it's stuff that stays with you. The second kind of family is the family you have now. And even if you don't have kids or grandchildren like Jack and I have, you do live around people and you probably do have a kind of a family right now. This is Jack and my family. And over on the right side of this picture is our son Bill and his kids. And on the left side of the picture is our daughter Joy and her five children. 
And this is what I constantly think when they come together. How can they be so different? <laughs> now take a look at the sizes of them here. I mean, there's the really big, 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 big boys. You see the one in the red shirt there? And you see the boy in the green shirt on the left side? There's two years difference between them. Yeah. So poor Elias always felt like the shrimp in the family. But there is another kind of family that you have. And that family I want you also to think about today as we talk about the, the us family. This family, this is your church family. The people that sit around you in church every week, this is another family you have. And I want you to think about the things we talk about today in terms of your church family also. The book of Genesis has five stories about sibling rivalry. It actually has more, but it has five major stories about sibling rivalry. And they include Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, Leah and Rachel, I had to get the girls in there, and Joseph and his brothers. All of these, these are the, some of these are the patriarchs of the church. All of them have family problems and sibling rivalry problems. Now, as I go forward, I'm assuming you kind of know the stories. I will have brief synopsises to kind of tie everything together, but I'm zeroing in on the Bible verses that show you what happens with sibling rivalry and what it leads to in families. So let's take a look at the family of Adam and Eve first. And so there are three people listed here, three children listed here, all sons. And the one that has the dark box, Cain, that dark box is always going to indicate who is oldest. Remember what I said, God is going to subvert, and he's going to make the youngest be the important one. So Cain and Abel are really what this story is about. Cain and Abel, two boys who had very different gifts and very different life purposes. Cain liked the, gar the gardening. He liked to grow fruit and vegetables. That was the gift God had given him. And Abel was a man who liked to be out with the animals in the field. He became a shepherd and took care of the sheep and did all those things. And one day God came to them and said, I want you each to prepare an offering and bring it to me. Sounds simple enough. And they know that they're going to make the offering out of what they actually do. However, they, what they didn't probably realize was this. When you bring an offering to God, later on, when you bring an offering and put it in the offering plate, or when you offer time at church to God, how you do it and why you do it makes all the difference. If you grumble, if you don't really want to do it, then it kind of wrecks the offering that you're bringing because God wants you to give with a generous and open heart. So let's see what happened with these two as they brought their, uh, their uh, offerings. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Okay, so do we know why he didn't have regard at this point? We don't. And, and really, this is one of the questions that people have always had. What did he do wrong? But what we do know is that when God didn't like his offering, Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, then sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you and you must rule over, and it means you must rule over your anger. You can't do this, and we know what happens. And the verse in, in Genesis 4, 8 says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And I always stopped there and said, what the heck did Cain say to Abel? Here's little Judy again, standing there going, what did he say? Again, Pastor Joe talked about it last week, suppositions. I, I don't know what he said, but here's what I suspect might have been something like this. Cain comes up to Abel and says, why do you always have to be such a show-off? Couldn't you just kind of step back a little bit and just do what you got to do and not make the rest of us look so bad? And I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't what he said to his brother. But what happened? Immediately after that, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. So we have anger, we have killing. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, 
I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Snotty mouth. Unbelievable talking to the Lord this way. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is the end for Abel. What happened to him? Because he couldn't control his anger. Cain is driven from his family, and he becomes a wanderer. That's the word the Bible uses. And I had to think about that when I was doing this. This is a guy who liked to grow his trees so he could pick the fruit and plant his field so he could harvest it in time. And now God said, nope, you're not going to have any orchards anymore, and you're not going to have fields to plow and to harvest. You're going to be a wanderer for the rest of your life. And then again, Cain again complained and said, well, somebody's going to kill me. It's going to get all around that I did this. And God said, OK, tell you what, put a mark on your forehead. And no one will kill you, because I will deal with them seven times worse if they kill you. And that's how Cain spent the rest of his life. So what do we learn in terms of families and sibling rivalry? rivalry? Cain did not do his best with his offering to God. And perhaps he blamed Abel for showing him up. Cain could not control his anger, and he killed. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus says, be angry, but do not sin. Anger is an emotion he gave you to use. What you do with your anger could be the thing that happened to Cain. Cain lied to God by, about what he had done. And I'm like, wow, are you silly, silly, silly boy. You don't lie to God. He always knows the truth. Yet, God had mercy on Cain and promised not to allow him to be killed. And so time goes on, and there are generations after generations in, in Genesis, and we get to Noah and that whole story, and Noah has three sons, and his son Shem then starts another line, and more generations go along. And eventually, we have a younger brother named Abraham, it was called Abram then, who eventually marries someone called Sarah, and he and Sarah by the root of Egypt, end up in what God has promised to them as the Holy Land. You probably all know this story, but if you don't, here it is in one sentence. Abraham and Sarah, who have been following God and the promise he has given him, have not had any children. Uh, they are about mm, 85 years old at this point in time. And God has promised them that he's going to bless them and bless their children and all this stuff. And you know what? Hagar, I mean... Sarah says, you know what, this isn't going to happen, and I don't, you know, I'm going to have to do something about this. She wasn't willing to wait for God. And so she goes ahead and she gets her Egyptian slave or servant, Hagar, and says, go in and spend the night with my husband, with Abraham, and we'll see what happens. And what happens is that Hagar gives birth to a little boy who is named Ishmael. So we've got Sarah who sends a slave girl in. Who, who gives Abraham his first, and at this point, only son. Now, at this point, what happens, we go ahead in time, and about 10 to 12 years later, Abraham and Sarah are visited by three strangers, and you probably remember that story, and they are told, pretty soon you're going to have this son, and it's all going to be okay. It's coming. Be prepared for it. And Sarah's like, yeah, not. I'm almost 100. And yet, what happens is what God promised. At about 99 to 100 years, I kind of read the Bible to try to figure out the time. Somewhere around 100 years old, Abraham and Sarah have their son Isaac, and they are so excited. And so now the family tree looks like this. And I look at this and go, oh, this is not good. Because Abraham has Hagar on one side and Sarah his wife. So Hagar is a concubine, Sarah is a wife. He has two sons, the oldest is Ishmael, and Isaac is just a, a, a little baby. And I, I want to remind you that when Isaac was born, Ishmael was 13. How many 13-year-olds really care about the babies in the family? Not too many, probably. So he probably didn't have anything really to do with them. So three more years go on, and the child, meaning Isaac, grew and was weaned. And I put up in the corner, that means I, Ishmael now is 16. And Isaac is only three years old. Again, what 16-year-old teenage boy has even time for a three-year-old brother? Maybe he'd watch him once in a while. We don't know. Again, we're making suppositions. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. I want you to think about that for a minute. Ishmael is running around. It's a big party. And Ishmael laughs. 
And Sarah takes it as a personal affront. Again, he's a 16-year-old boy running around with his friends, probably will laugh. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son, heir Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And then God continues and said, and I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. And I want you to know that this is the last time that Ishmael and Isaac as children in a family live together. Because immediately after that, Abraham sends away Hagar and Ishmael into the desert with a limited amount of food and a limited amount of water, and they almost die, but are saved by an angel. After that, Hagar and Ishmael go into Egypt, and Isaac stays with his father. So I'm not really sure that I see anything between the boys that cause sibling rivalry, but certainly the mothers talking to them about the brother they had probably had plenty to say because we've already seen how Sarah talks about Ishmael and Hagar. And yet, in Genesis 25, I find this one little verse that brings some happiness to me. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him. And that makes me happy, because I know that, at least at that point, they knew where each other were, and they came together, and that they had time to spend together. What did we learn from this story? Well, Sarah didn't want to wait for God's timing. She took it into her own hands. I'll send Hagar in. She became jealous of the love Abraham had for Ishmael, and she was worried about the promise and was afraid that Ishmael would take the promise from Isaac. But God had mercy on Ishmael, saved him and his mother, and gave him a nation. And Isaac and Ishmael buried Abraham together. So we've seen a, a reconciliation here. I can't tell you if it was a perfect reconciliation, but it was at least an attempt. I will tell you in my family, in 2001, my father died. I hadn't seen my sister, that sister I mentioned, for 10 years before that. She came to the funeral. I saw her at that, that period of time, and after I took after Jack and I took my mother back to our house, she attacked my other sister, physically attacked her. She was asked to leave, and none of us have seen her since then. Families can be really ugly because of sin, and it can really hurt, even to this day. So we go right away, so we're not skipping any generations. Now we've got Isaac. I want you to remember the, the family that Isaac came from, Isaac is 40 years old when he meets a woman named Rebecca, and he loves her and wants to marry her. But also, Rebecca is having problems conceiving, and she actually, when she does conceive, conceives twins. And one of them, Esau, is born minutes before Jacob. But let's see what God told Rebecca before the twins were born. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. So she did have that last promise, the older will, the older will serve the younger. And she put it in her mind and wasn't going to let it let go. So here's the two boys, and I, I love these pictures. Again, all of these pictures are from a website called Free Bible Images. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures that you can use if you're doing Sunday school lessons, or you just want to understand what it looked like, these pictures. And mo many of them have um, writing along the bottom, which I don't include. So Esau is the big, red, hairy guy with the red hair. He likes to hunt. And then the thin, fine featured, I like to stay in the tents because that's who I am, very different gifts given to them by God, is Jacob. We learn in Genesis 25 that when the boys grew up, Esau was a skilled hunter and a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. And then this horrible sentence, 
Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And that didn't change as long as those two were alive. And that's really a sad thing. And if they knew it, the parents knew it, and the kids absolutely knew who was the favorite. It was nice, I suppose you could say, that each one had a favorite, but it doesn't make a good family when that happens. And so there are many stories about the things that happened to Esau and Jacob, but the most telling one is at the end of Isaac's life, he is blind, and he says to his son Esau, go out, get some game, come home and make me one of your wonderful stews, bring it in to me, and I'm going to give you, because remember, he's the oldest, he should be given the blessing that Jacob has. I'm going to give you the blessing, and then all of this will be yours, because I'll be gone very soon. Who's standing outside of the tent? It's Rebecca, the mom. It's, this is all on Rebecca in many ways. She's listening to this and goes, oh no, that's not the way it's going to be. It's going to be the other way around. Jacob, come on over here. I've got some stew that I made. And I also got some of Esau's clothes. Here, put these on. And here, I've got a couple goat skins. Put them on your arms because your father's going to want to hug Esau and feel his arms to make sure it's him. And you go in and give him the stew and then get your father's blessing. Does Jacob say a word to his mother about this probably isn't the right thing to do? The answer is no. He was a good, obedient son. Yeah, not. He had to know this was wrong. But he did go ahead and do it. And he went in and he tricked his dad. And what do you think happened when Esau came home? He was furious. And he went in to talk to his father and told him what had happened. His father said, I don't have any more blessings to give you. It's kind of like, once it's given, it's given, and yeah, there's nothing left. Sorry. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are, are approaching. In other words, when dad dies, I will kill my brother Jacob. Here we go, another one that wants to kill his brother because of what's been going on between them. And so this is one of those pictures that really hit me when I looked at it and I thought, I understand his anger. I absolutely understand his anger. And here is Jacob walking around, carrying stuff around. And I would love to be in this picture and go, Jacob, I wouldn't turn your back on him because this guy's mad. And Rebecca knew this and she sent Jacob away to go to her brother's, one of her relatives in a far country where he could live and be safe away from Esau. The two are separated for many, many years at this point. When uh, Rebekah and um, Isaac die, even uh, Esau goes away from that area. He just goes to another land. What happens? Well, the end is kind of an interesting story, but I'll put it in like two sentences. Eventually, Jacob has a bunch of children, and we'll learn about them next. He has a bunch of children, but God calls him back to where he lived because that's where everything is going to take place. But in getting back there, he has to go by where his brother Esau is living, and he's heard his brother has become very wealthy and very powerful. And so he's on his way home, and he's like, oh, I hope he doesn't see us. I hope he doesn't see us. Well, maybe I should send something to him and offer him uh, uh, something to, so he'll, he'll let us go by. He's scared to death. And eventually what happens, he sees... Esau coming with 400 men, and he goes, oh, this is not good. And one of the things when I read it the first time in the Bible, I was like, are you kidding me? He takes all his wives and his concubines and all his children, and he puts them in the front. And I'm like, really, Jacob? So if, he, if, if you're saying if Esau's coming to kill you, you're going to put the kids and the wives first? Eventually, good things get better, and he comes out, and he goes forward to meet Esau, and guess what happens? It's a wonderful meeting. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept together. It was a beautiful reconciliation. So what do we learn here? From the very beginning, Isaac and Rebekah preferred one child over the other. Brothers' jealousy, there's that word jealousy again, led to hatred, there's that awful word again. Rebekah lied to and tricked Isaac. Jacob was part of it, and then Esau wanted to kill Jacob. It's just awful. But Esau forgave Jacob and welcomed him, 
and God mercifully allowed them to be reconciled. So you're seeing this pattern coming up again and again, God bringing them back together. So now we go to the family of Jacob. And this one gets a little more involved because what we're talking about is before, obviously, he put all his family out in front of him, what he thought he was going to charge. And we start with Jacob and Rachel, who he fell in love with when he was out with his mother's relatives, a man named Laban. And he, when he was with Laban, he saw one of Laban's daughters, and her name was Rachel, and she was gorgeous. But Rachel also had a sister named Leah, which, who was let's just say not as gorgeous. In fact, she was probably very plain compared to her sister, Rachel. But Jacob wanted Rachel, and so he went to Laban, and Laban said, you work for me seven years, and I'll give you Rachel. And then if you know the story, you know the trick that um, Laban played on Jacob. So this is after the seven years. But in the evening, he, meaning Laban, took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her, and in the morning, behold, oh my gosh, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban then said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Here again, cultural expectations. So dad fixed it. And can you imagine what that fixed between the two girls? between Rachel and Leah, how that made them feel about each other and what their father had done to them. Laban continues and says, complete the week of this one and we will give you the others also in return for serving me another seven years. So Jacob went into Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Now I can live with that one a little bit. And he served Laban for another seven years. This second paragraph makes me want to cry every time I read it. And when the Lord saw that Le Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. I gave him a son, maybe now he'll love me. She has five more sons, and every time she has a son, that's what she says, maybe now my husband will love me. How sad of a life and a family is that? This is how the family actually looks in terms of these two actual wives. Leah has six sons. Rachel has two sons. She actually dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. So he doesn't have her that long, Jacob. See how I put Judah in yellow letters? I kind of think this is God's way of making it up to Leah. Judah is the family from, the, from which David will come, from which Joseph will be part of that family. That's why he went to Bethlehem. So he becomes part of the line that is described in the Bible. But we all know about Joseph. And now we talk about Reuben and the five brothers and Joseph. Remember, we've got five brothers or six brothers living with their mother Leah but also seeing every single day that everybody prefers Joseph and Benjamin over them. And to add to it, Joseph is a very kind of strange kid because he has a lot of dreams and he likes to stand around and tell his brothers about his dreams. And in his dreams he tells his brothers, he has this one all the time, where there are 12 sheaves of wheat and they bend over to a sheaf of wheat in the middle and he's like, what does God mean by this? And the brothers are like, yeah, forget it, we're going out to the fields and we're going to take care of the sheep and you're just a silly kid. But it gets worse. It gets to the point that they hate him. And why do they hate him? This is why they hated him. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any, of, any other of his sons. Yowie. Because he was the son of his old age and Rachel. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And we know the story of what happens when their anger is really kindled and Joseph is sent out to bring supplies and a message from his father to the boys who are out in the desert and how they want to kill him. Kill him. And Reuben says, well, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit and eventually they sell him to the Egyptians. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, 
He tore his clothes and he returned to his brothers and he said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? And then they, meaning all the brothers, took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat and they dipped the robe in the blood and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found, please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. How eh, evil. And here's a picture of that. And if I were in that picture, I know these are big guys, I'd be standing in the back of them going, you who, they're lying, he's alive, don't believe a word they say, and they stand there and they lie with impunity to their father. Just a horrible thing. And then we know that the rest of the story brings goodness with it. We know that Joseph is taken to Egypt, he goes into prison, he comes out, he becomes put in charge of all the storehouses of Egypt. He remembers his dream, he starts saving all the wheat that's possible before a famine comes because he knows it's gonna come. And when it finally comes, eventually, all of his brothers come to try to buy grain from Egypt. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And that happy day comes after he sends them back to get Benjamin, the father, and they return and they meet each other and they greet each other and he tells them who he is. And we have this beautiful verse. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is not only reconciliation, but it's recognition of how God can take a horrible situation and make good come out of it, not only for this family, but for all of the Israelites who survive that terrible famine back in the Promised Land. What do we learn? God blessed Jacob's forsaken wife, Leah, and blessed her with six sons. Laban's lies and deceits created problems that lasted forever between Leah and Rachel. Joseph and Benjamin, the children of Rachel, were Jacob's favorites. Joseph's older brothers got jealous of the love and attention he got. In the end, Joseph forgave his brothers, and in his mercy, God had a plan for every single one of them. And so I ask you, how does this apply to us? How do, how do we take this and put it in our three families? The family we came from, the family we are now in, and our church family. A special word to those of you who are parents or grandparents. I put the first one is kind of a no-brainer. Two wives is not a good idea. <laughs> Do I repeat it again, gentlemen. Two wives is not a good idea. You can see what happened. But this is the one that we all have to look at. Love your children equally and encourage their different gifts, talents, and faith. Every night I pray for that. I honestly try. I, I hope I come across to my kids that way, but I pray for God's help in loving my children equally and encouraging who they are and what they are and their talents and their faith equally. And so what's God's plan for those of us who are brothers and sisters? What's God's plan for each of us who are sitting here? Proverbs 17 says, a brother is born to help in times of adversity. Friends, will, you know, friends and acquaintances will be around, but you should be able to rely on your brother when times really, really get tough. In Exodus, we are told, you shall not covet, and then a bunch of things, and then the word anything. Covet means jealous, be jealous of, and want to have it as your own. All that jealousy we saw never should have happened. We're not to be covetous of anything else about anyone else. Psalms tell us, how, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity, when they act together as a group. And we know in Corinthians that God tells us that love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. In Colossians, we're told, do not lie to one another. Not even white lies, just don't lie. We also find that we are supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. The word neighbor means those people who live close to you. Who lives closer to you, or in your early life, than your brother and sister? Love them as yourself. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of his brothers and sisters. That's what God wants of us. Finally, all of you, we, sitting here today, 
have a unity of mind, a sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. This is what God's plan is for brothers and sisters. What should we do when we walk out of here? What do we do? I would suggest that we ask the Holy Spirit to expose and remove any jealousy, any jealousy we have to any, in any of our families. Secondly, pledge to not lie to each other, but to share the real truth in grace and in love. Watch your words, how you do it. And there's the rest of our verse of the month, and the truth will set you free. You lie, the lie keeps going, and it gets deeper and deeper, and you can't get out of it. We need to encourage the faiths and the gifts of our brothers and sisters in all of our families. We need to encourage the gifts that all of you have to bring into the church and to make the church even more vibrant in God's kingdom. We are to love our brothers and sisters unconditionally, and we should also pray for reconciliation if it is needed. If you don't need it in your family, you are blessed. If you need it, keep praying for it. God may not allow it simply because of what the, where the other person is, but it's something that we should be praying for. And so I thought about a lot about what happened in those families and how awful it was and yet how God used them. And I was thinking about last weekend, sibling love, the idea, what does sibling love look like? So what does sibling love and unity and encouragement and truth look like? And, and I, I think I've shared with you before, whenever I do these sermons, I go through a period of time when I just, God pours all this stuff into me and I'm writing and I'm praying and it's just a wonderful time. And then I'm close to the end and then Satan comes and he whispers in my ear and he goes, yeah, no, that, nobody's gonna like that. Everybody knows this stuff and, you know, this is stupid. You should not be doing this. Maybe you should start from scratch again. And so last Saturday, this was going on in my head. But that was really hard for me because last Saturday, Jack and I were preparing our house and grounds for the baptisms we were going to have. And I'm like, Lord, please confirm to me something that I'm doing the right thing today. And this is what God did. He brought two sisters Anya and Kayla into the water to be baptized together, to encourage each other, to pray for each other. And I was like, wow. And then you know what he did? He brought another set of sisters into the water. We've never had that before. We have never had sisters walk into the water together to pray for and encourage and be with each other. And we have Charlotte and Amelia being baptized. And then because God is perfect and God's perfect number is three, and we had the third set of sisters come into the water to encourage each other, pray for each other, encourage their faith, and be with each other. And I said that night, thank you, Jesus. I know what I'm doing next Sunday. We don't want you to have sibling rivalry within your family. We want you to have this kind of love. And to see it last Sunday, to me, was the greatest blessing I'd had in a long time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today you reminded us about the danger of sin in our personal and church families. Lord, through the Holy Spirit, help us to be better parents and grandparents by loving and encouraging each of our children equally and completely. Help us to remove jealousy and lies from our lives with our brothers and sisters. And Lord, help us instead to encourage our brothers and sisters to live in faith for the purposes you have made for them. In your holy name we pray, amen. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. You've been searching, carrying burdens. You've been lost, looking for a home. You've been drifting, something is missing. You should know you are not alone.
time to waste Open your heart, don't be afraid Jump on in, the water is fine Sailing in the river of life Come as you are, no time to waste Open your heart, don't be afraid Jump on in, the water is fine Sailing in the river of life Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same Everything will change Let that river of life wash it all away Let us pray for over the offering. Lord Jesus, we return part of the gifts you have given us to you. Not only the gifts that are in these trays, but also the gifts of our time and our heart and, our, and all the things you have given us that we use in our kingdom. Lord, use these gifts and help us use these gifts wisely and with your, with your, um, with your idea of what, how they have to be used. Please, Lord, uh, help us now. And um, thank you for blessings that you have given us in all, all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn 370, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Stand if you are able, um, and we'll sing this song together and go to our final benediction after that. Our benediction for the last time, um, we'll have a new one next week, is this verse from John. Read it with me, please, and then I'll pray. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
Lord, as we leave this gathering of our church family today, may we take with us the promise of the Holy Spirit to remind and to help us to put away jealousy and lying, to love each brother and sister in all our families unconditionally, to bring reconciliation where it is needed, and to help us in all our families to encourage and stand beside those you have put in our families. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.